The Vampire Testament Written by Steve Gray And narrated by the author The night air had a tinge of moisture to it Light vapors gracefully whipped about the atmosphere Briefly glistening as rays from the bright, full moon accentuated their forms The coolness of the evening could be considered tolerable Even as it had a slight prickliness to it Ancient, twisted oak trees writhed a dance of visual torment as their decrepit branches interlocked and fastened with each other high above the ground. Gingery moss swayed and fluttered in the breeze, resembling torn cloth from a girl's dress. Even though the environment was abundant with its serenity, a foreboding threat wandered the grounds. Approaching the locked gates of a nearby forgotten cemetery, the being known to mankind, as well as to all the things in heavens above, as Lucifer stood before them. His cloak and hood slowly swayed in the evening breeze, much like the dance of the moss hanging from the oak trees. He noticed that an oversized padlock bound the gates together. He also noticed that the lock was old, rusty, and was nearly fused to the hook latch that held the gates together and was overgrown with foliage. The lock hadn't been released in ages, centuries maybe. The appearance of the cemetery with its broken and rust-ridden wrought iron posts and spikes, along with the build-up of several veins and arteries of dry rotted vines as well as fresh new overgrowth gave evidence that this resting ground had been undisturbed in forever. This appearance was surely a prelude to how the interior was going to be. This was indeed the one he sought. He knew that. He stared at the padlock for a few seconds, and as he did, the growth which smothered it began to pop and crackle. Small streams of smoke ascended, resembling small, thin serpents as they rose skyward. A reddish glow started to envelop the padlock as the growth, both old and new, was burned away. As the devil's gaze grew more fixed upon the lock, the ancient steel began to liquefy, turning into a viscid lava. It was a slow process as the metallic liquid lazily dripped and ebbed down the sizzling lines of the weeds as well as the bracings of the gate. Once the padlock was completely gone, he simply blew a slight wisp of breath toward the gates, and they flew open with enough force to equal ten men kicking them open. Leaves from the growth, which clutched the gate, showered to the ground in small cyclones as Lucifer slowly treaded inside. His steps were a slow procession among the ankle-high mists which obscured his hooves. Subtle moans and weeping seemed to be audible from within the earth under some of the graves, moans which seemed to explain the fear and agony recognizing the presence of the one who walked the ground above. Now, as this was obviously an unkempt, deserted resting place, the overgrowth was so thick as to hide nearly every headstone which stood low to the ground. Lucifer's gaze surveyed the area in search of one grave, one soul, his best advocate and servant. It had been an eternity, it seemed, since he had heard his prayers, but then Lucifer had become consumed. The apocalyptic prophecies were rapidly approaching, and the war plan was his all-consuming passion. His guilt for not hearing his servant's prayers and praises, however, was minimal after all. He is the author of cruelty and the father of anger. Still, when news met his ear regarding the tragedy that happened to him, a silent rage blistered within his blackened heart, a rage that was directed toward both the Almighty as well as to the people who were responsible for it. How could this patent failure have happened, he thought. He still recalls the night that he received the news. It was storming in the place where he was meditating, the place was as somber and as darkened as his own heart. It was a disgusting, slimy alleyway in the seediest section of a godless city. In fact, the only amulet that may have echoed a memory of a holy god was a broken, chipped stone cross which perched high above an abandoned storefront that was used at one time by a congregation as a church. Its dead silhouette shone black against the lightning skies, which strobed periodically during the storm. 
Bodies of the drunken and drugged littered the alley among piles of trash and filth. Drums blazed with fires that were used by vagrants to keep warm. This was the perfect place, complete with its pain and anguish. Here he could concentrate and feed upon the feast of hopelessness and negativity. A demon approached him to relay the news of his servant. He informed the devil that he had been cruelly slain by knights of the Almighty, and then his corpse was defiled in accordance with Christian rites of vampiric purging. Two members of the order had destroyed his servant in the most humiliating fashion. The slaughter had been calculated, planned with extreme surgical care, and according to the ritual, could never again be undone. The demon relayed the grisly details of his servant's destruction. Once they killed him by placing him in front of the court's riflemen, the two members of the order took his coffin to the tomb. The priest initiated the ritual. He rammed a nearly petrified wooden stake into his servant's chest and smashed his heart. The putrid blood oozed in splashes as the priest's hammer struck the head of the stake. A foul stench filled the tomb, a dead stink, a coppery smell mixed with rot that was immeasurable in its rancidness. The priest then wrenched the head from the body. He stuffed the mouth with garlic bulbs. He placed so much in the mouth that a few of the bulbs that were covered with blood began to fall from the open throat, dropping to the floor. The priest's accomplice placed the hands above the body to hang over the brim of the casket. He crossed himself with one swift stroke. He cut the hands from the wrists, and they fell to the earthen floor of the tomb. The scene was gruesome and the two involved were extremely challenged to stay the course of what they believed needed to be done in holy honor. They gasped the foul air and held it within their sore lungs as they completed their mission. They turned the blood-drenched torso to face downward inside the musty casket, took the head, and placed it at the feet. Then they stuffed the severed hands under each armpit. This was to ensure that, despite any effort made by the vampire to reanimate, it would be impossible. They closed the coffin and took heavy chains, which they brought with them, and tightly chained it up. They loaded it onto a carriage and took it to the most remote, unknown cemetery to bury it, and forget it, and there it had remained for years. Lucifer recalled his anger that night as he slowly walked among the stones. As he did... Weeds and dried growth shriveled and smoked as he waved his hands over them. After a short while, he eventually found what he had come for, his servant's burial. He knew this because of the disgusting psychic aura that was billowing from the ground where he lay. He knew it was him. He took a few steps toward it and spoke one simple command. Rise. The ground began to shake violently and separate. The contour appearing to be the top of a coffin broke the ground. It was covered with layers of mud and rusted heavy chains. Once the coffin made final ascension and rested above the ground, the devil ripped the chains from it and tore the lid from its frame. The corpse inside was mutilated and mummified. It was only dimly lit by the blue luminescence of the moon. He grabbed the torso by the collar and sat it upright. The skeletal hands which had been shoved into the armpits fell to its side. He picked up the head, which was fused with rot to the feet, and scraped the shriveled garlic bulbs out of his mouth with his clawed finger. He then placed it atop of the shoulders. He took the hands that were at the corpse's side and placed them back on the wrists. As the mortifying corpse sat upright in the coffin, the devil spoke become. In a matter of moments, the corpse, which had been in pieces and rotting, was now complete and burned with new life. Oh, master, the corpse said, oh, how I have been wronged. The devil nodded in acknowledgment. The people of the religious order interpreted my service unto you as vampirism. I know that I have failed you. The corpse rose its hands to its face. I know that's why you are here, to punish me, it said. On the contrary, the devil replied. I've come to give you the opportunity to damn those who have damned you, he continued. Now, 
Surely, this hypocritical religious order has spawned further generations and descendants. The corpse slowly raised its gaze to look at Lucifer. I have given you a second life, as well as the discerning to hunt them down, Lucifer said. What's been done to you was foul, and this will be the chance you need to have your revenge. I will say this, the devil continued, I will no longer be involved in your matters, because I have my own troubles to tend to. The gift I have given you, I am positive that you will not misuse it. Master, as you know, I have only lived to serve you, the corpse said. My gratitude is endless that I will have my vengeance, for they wronged me twice, because you know I was not a vampire. The devil's face melted into a sinister, frightening grin. You are now, he said, and he slowly turned to exit the cemetery. The Vampire Testament 2 Revelations The low-hanging haze that continued to hug the grounds remained thick and palpable. The mists embraced the ankles of the newborn undead, who was standing beside the wet and muddy ramshackle ruin of his coffin, which was still cloaked in rusted, broken chains. Nocturnal insects slowly crept and crawled over its hull, inspecting the textures of the surface and the rust flakes on the chain links, looking like browsers at a bazaar. The night remained black and with a slight breeze. The vampire watched as Satan made a slow stride outside of the ancient graveyard gates. He watched through a curious form of vision at the swaying cloak of the devil and the subsequent footfalls of his cloven hooves as they met the moist ground. He looked through sight that would have been perceived by people of the modern technological age as glitchy video, and he swayed to and fro stupidly like a tower in high winds. At this particular moment, he felt lost. Although he knew, through a newly awakened subconsciousness, that he had a purpose, as well as a new life, a voice in his mind that seemed to come from some distant time and place, rattled out a staggering assertion, You are damned. This stilled his swaying and sent a shiver down his spine for a minute. He stood with his head in his hands, much the way he did when he faced the devil upon his resurrection. The sounds of the insects surrounding the cemetery seemed to increase in volume. The intensity of the noise seemed to grow steadily, causing the vampire pain. The searing noise grew. His pain grew. And as his pain grew, so did his fury. This infuriating dissonance ripped through his ears, and he began to roar himself. In a brief few seconds as to what seemed like an eternity to him, both he and the night bugs delivered a deafening chorus of screams. And in a wink, it was silent, and the night was still again, save for his heavy gasps as he continued to hold his hands tightly to his ears. He slowly looked up and gazed upon the night sky with a nervous visage. He panned his vision from the western sky, which was still decorated with wisps of grayish-purple clouds, they slowly glided overhead and masked the stars in scattered fashion. And as his gaze progressed toward the eastern sky, a fist of horror gripped his heart. He saw the black of the sky overhead fading gradually into a violet, which from there was fading into a lighter shade of lavender. The lavender tone was melting into a pinkish color as he stared even further toward the eastern sky. The sun was rising. He couldn't comprehend why he was being held in the grip of this feeling of terror, but he knew, if even only through instinct, that he did not want to be here when the sun rose. In the east, the eastern skies, where it was said by the Christians so many times that the Son of Man would return to gather up the church and the dead in Christ, while all others would be annihilated and judged. He knew, 
even if only through instinct, that the sun does return. There is always a new day, and the day is not for the damned. As he thought these thoughts, the pinkish color was descending to an orange tone to its declivity. He quickly looked around him, and he rested his sight back upon his broken casket. Would that protect me? He thought. But it was a ruined wreckage, and he had to move quick. The daylight was increasing, and soon the sun would reveal itself. He frantically looked around the cemetery, and in the distance he saw a possibility. A mausoleum. How? How could that protect me? He thought. He would find out. He broke into a full run on surprisingly agile feet toward the gray structure. He felt the pursuit of the fingers of the first rays of sunlight following quickly behind. As he was quickly approaching the marble building, he saw no point of access, and his panic grew to a fever pitch. What would, what could he do? In life, he was somewhat renowned for his circumspection, but this was his second life. His redemption and self-preservation combined with his fury had transformed him now. He reached the mausoleum. He rounded all four corners of its cracked and chipped existence to see that the access gates to the interior vaults were chained and bolted shut. But the sun was now showing like the lanula in a fingernail over the ridge line, so this mattered not. He wrenched the chains and bolts from one of the access gates and quickly entered the tumble-down structure in short order. The hallway acted only as a shelter from whatever adverse rainy weather there would be. But it wasn't raining now. He looked at both sides of the vault, looking at a great assortment of crypts. Dates that were even parallel with the time that he was alive the first time. The pinkish and orange ambience was now growing brighter in tone, and the air was gradually becoming warmer. The croaking and hissing night bugs had become silent. The quilt of mists that were adorning the old grass of the graveyard were now dissipating. As the vampire looked upon the crypts, he lightly drummed his chin with his fingers in anticipation of his next move. He would rest in one of the crypts today, and then he would have the whole of the coming night to adjust himself properly to his new state of being. With no time to waste, he would carefully pluck the faceplate from one of the crypts, slither his way in, and lie still next to the coffin inside the enclosure. That was, of course, after carefully placing the faceplate back where it belonged, because if and when the cemetery keepers, if there were any at this desolate place, returned, they would be alerted to the upturned grave where he had initially been for so long. They would inspect the entire grounds, fearing that grave robbers had ravaged the place. So, of course, they would inspect the mausoleum, and seeing that the access gate was ripped off, they would be well justified in doing so. So what he planned to do... He then quickly did, and then he rested in that place and waited for the sun to complete its observation of the grounds for the day, and waited for the night to come. The heat of the day was stifling. The vampire lay in the near-roasting enclosure and was annoyed occasionally by the scampering of a rat over his body, or quick scuttling of the brazen centipede across his gaunt features. It was a long, miserable, and restless day for the vampire. In fact, rest was the furthest thing from his mind, as he wanted to lay out the architecture of his new life. Where would he start? With whom would he start? These questions were like a looped rhythm in his mind. As the final remnants of the day began to dissolve, he was struck by another sensation. Hunger. He would have to feed. Still, the minutes passed, and he could feel the heat of the day decrease its clench on the atmosphere. And then, through the faceplate of the crypt where he lay, he could faintly hear the chiming of the symphony of night bugs. As he lay in a place that was cooped and cramped, he had to slither like a serpent to be able to remove the faceplate in order to peer outside to see how much of the night had advanced. When he peered through the crack in the faceplate that he had gently pushed out of its groove, he could see... It was twilight. He could now exit the confines of the tight enclosure. He had all night to make better arrangements now. In the next hour, the night was full-blown, and the vampire emerged from the narrow opening of the crypt. 
His movements were refreshingly limber. He had almost seemed to maneuver much like the night mists. Graceful. Stealthy. He replaced the front of the crypt to its proper fitting and then turned to face the outward world. He was hungry, so it was time to feed. As he made a graceful, nearly levitating stride across the mist-covered grounds of the cemetery, he observed the night hoppers in the grass, quickly making leaps as if to make way for his coming. The vampire advanced toward the opening gates of the graveyard, and noticed that they were still lying in the defeated position they had been since Satan had blown them open before. This made him pause. He looked around, seeing through that glitchy video and glanced back at his former grave. It hadn't been disturbed. It lay in the same position it had been. It lay angularly, half in, half out of the ruptured grave, resembling the desolate wreckage of a ship that had run aground, broken, busted, and humbled. This gave him two thoughts. One, groundskeepers never came. Maybe there were none. This was good. The second thought was more of an emotion, festering rage, and remembrance recalling his captors and accusers, envisioning what they had done to him all those centuries ago. The images that played against the screen of his mind resembled broken movie scenes, and soon his rage transformed into determination. Then, as he stared at the defiled casket, he vowed that people would be just as broken, gutted, and forgotten as that coffin. He turned to exit the cemetery, and he then stood upon a hazed-covered dirt and gravel road which worked its serpentine progression toward the lights of a town. He would start there. He started toward the lights, toward the town, toward the nearest establishment where he could find something to satiate his hunger, and he found it. Act 2 A car which in fact was the most curious appearing thing in the eyes of the vampire as he had never seen one before, was slowly pulling into an open parking slot in front of a tavern. The vampire stayed in the blackened cloak of the night's darkness and was perched upon his haunches as he watched a lone person exit the car and enter the bar. He was well dressed. His clothing was regal and sophisticated, thought the vampire and as he thought this, looked down at the ragged sleeves on his own arms and the rotted fabric of the rest of his clothing, torn and shredded from ages of decay. It was gradually falling from his body in moistened, frayed clumps. I'll need his clothing, the vampire murmured to himself. With the grace of a cat, he crept across the rooftop and leapt to the ground at the rear of the tavern. There was a vacant lot just adjacent to the tavern's parking lot. There was a dense gathering of pine trees just in front of the vacant lot. It acted as a divider between the field and the parking lot of the tavern. This, the vampire thought, would make an excellent killing ground. If he acted quickly, he could swiftly take the victim out of earshot of any nearby patrons, feast upon his lifeblood, and replace the tattered vesture that he was currently wearing with the lavish clothing of his intended prey. He planned the intricate details of his attack and made his way back to the darkened rooftop with a near weightless leap. He shambled back to the front of the tavern, returned to the perch of his haunches, and waited. The man in the expensive clothing... The dark slate tuxedo sat at the bar. The tavern's interior was quiet, except for a tune that played on an old jukebox that stood as a lone sentry in the shadowed corner. The song that played was going on about someone being a fool to do someone else's dirty work. As he sat alone, he stared down at the brown, varnished bar, which was nicked and scratched from years of wear from beer bottles, shot glasses, and the knuckles of fingers that possibly removed their wedding rings, the well-dressed man thought. A curious thought, he mused. He continued his vacant stare at the bar's surface. He observed crude writing that someone had etched out, probably with a pocket knife some years back. The writing scribed the words, Never again. A slight chuckle escaped the man's lips. <laughs> Goddamn right, he muttered. 
He tried to grasp the thread of his thoughts. His eyes slowly wandered toward the shot glass of bourbon that was now being placed in front of him. He had almost forgotten that he had asked for it a minute or two prior. He was not having a good night. She had walked out on him. He stared at his bourbon. It cast a shimmering amber light reflection upon his weathered features. He picked the glass up, gave it a soft swirl, and downed the whiskey. As he sat the glass back on the bar, he thought, Never again. He looked around and surveyed the rest of the tavern. It was dead tonight. There were only a few smiling faces. A look or two of despair, and there wasn't even a great deal of stale cigarette smoky air either. The bartender slapped a drying towel over his shoulder and approached the man in the tuxedo. Hey, buddy. You ready for another? He looked up at the bartender who was grabbing the empty shot glass. Nah, thanks. I think I'll just make my way home, he replied. No sense in making things worse than they are. The bartender smirked. You hear the boss, guy. Have a safe night. The man paid his tally, and after having spent around an hour and a half at the tavern, stepped off of the bar stool and started toward the exit, the exit of which he would be walking into the cool, black night, and where, unbeknownst to him, a predator waited for him. The man fumbled for the keys in his pocket. As he lightly staggered toward the car, he noticed an abnormal chill drape over his face as a brisk breeze swirled from nothing. He shuddered briefly, looked around at the quiet, near-empty plaza parking lot. Once his keys were in hand, he shrugged and reached for the car's door handle. A slight release of the handle was as far as he was able to get when he was snatched up by the back of his collar with a force and acceleration that stunned him instantly and caused constellations to swirl in his immediate and peripheral vision. Something had him. He was airborne. He watched in mortal horror as his car, as well as the tavern, the parking lot, were now decreasing in size, getting smaller, smaller, smaller. And soon, he was descending upon an open field with the speed of a person with an open parachute. He screamed. When he made his imminent contact with the grass of the field, he landed on an empty bag from a fried chicken restaurant that had obviously been discarded by litterers recently. His body trembled uncontrollably with a debilitating fear he'd never felt before. Not since he was a child and faced unexplained fears that every child faces until age and education make a child privy to rational explanations of what they were afraid of. The chicken restaurant bag, which still contained unfinished food, possibly fries, maybe some remaining nuggets, clung to his lapel. He peeled it off and stared at it foolishly for a second before frantically throwing it to the side. His head whipped back and forth, desperately trying to understand what had just happened. His panicked breaths were visible in rhythmic plumes of steam from his mouth and nostrils. They seemed to form apparitions against the blackened ambience. Crickets could be heard in the field, and in the distance, the steady hissing sound of traffic from the highway could be heard. He looked around with eyes wide, and suddenly his look held fixed to a figure standing in the field. A silhouette. A dark figure about twenty-five yards from where he stood. Thick billowing mists hung suspended from the dark figure's waist down. Hey, who are you? The man in the sweaty tuxedo called. The figure did not respond. I said, who the fuck are you? Did you just see what happened? Nothing. The man thought that maybe he was looking at nothing. Maybe a bush, a small tree, an optical illusion. He couldn't really tell in this unlit darkness. He stood breathing heavily, looking around him. He began to attempt to make slow steps back toward the lights of the tavern and the plaza that were visible beyond the wall of the pine trees. The billowing fog that he'd witnessed a minute prior was now engulfing him where he stood. It was pungent and thick. It had a stench. The smell of long dead things. Eroded life. Then... The bush, the small tree, stood right in front of him. It was no bush. It was no tree. The man in the tuxedo could now see this. It was a man, a man whose eyes were luminescent, glowing much the way phosphorus glows brightly against a black backdrop. 
The figure's gaze held the man in the tuxedo's eyes locked in a paralyzing stare. What was this? The man thought. Who was this? Where was this? His disorientation grew as he became lost in this figure's fixed stare. Slowly, the visage of the figure formed a grin, one that revealed jagged incisors with two fiercely pronounced canines that looked as though they would be better fitted in the mouth of a good-sized dog, German Shepherd or Doberman, but not in the mouth of this frightening, malnourished-looking person who was flashing the most horrific broad smile. The man in the tuxedo was lost in what seemed to be a dream world, only a quarter conscious. Fingers seemed to be materializing from the thick mists. They seemed to be slowly caressing his body. The dark figure's grin remained and the man's ecstasy was swelling. Who are you? The man in the tuxedo asked shakingly as he stood upon weakened legs that were nearly refusing to hold him up. This question made the figure pause uneasily. His wide, fierce, clown-like grin was melting. Who exactly was he? He was thinking. Who had he been? Why was it that he was unable to remember something as simple as his name? Without an answer, he said nothing and slowly advanced toward the man in the tuxedo. The sensual murk continued to caress and keep the well-dressed man gripped in a dreamlike state of ecstasy. Sex. He was envisioning sex with an exotic being, the most satisfying hallucination. The hair, the olive skin, the spread, the smell. He could actually believe that this was happening. His vision was being obscured by the thick and palpable clouds of the murk. The dark, grinning being stood just inches in front of him, and gradually he began to be afraid. This being was threatening, imposing. The man in the tuxedo was sensing now that he was in real danger. Being snatched out of his fantasy like a child who was being jerked out of a circus exhibit that he'd snuck into. This was too much. He was wide awake. This figure's evil, grinning face was only inches from his. Who are... He gibbered. I am your death. The vampire croaked. His right hand, now full of unearthly strength that had been rotting in his left armpit just 24 hours ago, was now vertical with fingers wide. Sharp, one-inch claws extended from each finger. The fog swirled around the figure's hand, and after about a moment's time, time enough for the man in this tuxedo to get a direct look at what was in front of him. The wretched claws sliced through the mist, as well as the man in the tuxedo's throat. The haze became pink with molecules of the man's blood, and a crimson fluid covered the vampire's fingers. Arterial life shot in streams from the man's carotid as the vampire bathed. His hunger was sated. A short time passed, and soon the savage vampire completed his opulent bloodbath and feast. The corpse lay in the littered grass with limbs topsy-turvy. It looked like a discarded rag doll in perfect place with the rest of the trash in the field. The vampire, fully satisfied, rose from his haunches in the persistent billowing mist vapors. He was still pestered, by the former man in the tuxedo's question. Who are you? Who was he? With no discernible name, he was just a beast. No, this can't be, but this is, of course, something that he could ponder. Currently, he wanted the corpse's clothes, so he began to disrobe the man's body. Shoes, socks, pants, shirt, everything, including cufflinks. As it happens, he was only slightly smaller in size than the dead man had been, so this set of clothing was a near-perfect fit. When the vampire was fully dressed in all but the jacket, he stood regal against the silky night air, totally enveloped in fog that regarded him as its ruler. 
He pulled the tuxedo jacket up to his view to reveal the tag on the inner collar. The tag read the label, Vargas of London. The vampires stood in a moment of knowing, informally called a Eureka moment. Vargas. He stood among the mists in this littered field, standing above the lifeless body of his prey. Vargas. My name is Vargas. This would be the name from henceforth that would strike mortal fear into the hearts of everyone. He slid his arms through the sleeves of the jacket which was still spongy with his prey's blood, and as it rested upon his torso, he turned to disappear in the haze. The night remained. All was quiet. Part 2 The Woman in the Strip Club In a strip club on a sordid part of Nebraska Avenue, a woman dances on the stage, giving everything she has. Her tits aren't much to look at, but she wears them well. She remembers when she was 14, how perky they were then, and how all the guys at her school would elbow each other as she walked by, and just knowing that they fantasized about her every night instead of the Playboy Bunny of the Month or the penthouse spreads when they commenced their self-gratification made her so damned proud. Those days are, of course, gone. She was 26 now. Times were different. She had to make a living. She prances around the pole with an effort that almost comes without trying. The pole is a part of her. The man at the base of the stage stares at her with a look of utter desire. Well... Who doesn't cast that glance at her in this place? He's a stout, African-American man. Ugh, she thinks. But then, at least he's not a whitey. Whitey is pretentious, puffed up, patronizing, and just plain cheap. This man, from what she can see overflowing in his fists, has money. After all, that's why she's degraded herself in this place night after night, right? She is such a gracefully flowing seductress in her display of sluttiness. As she slinks closer to this black man, God, I hate being here, she thinks as she pretends. The man's desire almost seems savage in its display, but she continues forth with a look that says, I want you, now. As she spreads her legs and drapes them over the shoulders of the man, displaying the soft area that up close only a few hundred have witnessed, giving off the sweet, sour aroma for the man's utter enjoyment, a handsome man walks in the door of a club. He's a whitey. But God, is he good-looking. He sits at the bar and orders a shot of Jack and Coke, and once the blonde bartender gives it to him, collects cash, makes change, he slowly turns to face the scenario that had been playing out before he walked in. He sees me, she thinks as she continues to writhe around the man's shoulders. God, he's the man of my dreams. He's what I've always seen myself with. After quite a while, the white man, after drinking in both his shot and the scene in which he's come to see, lays a ten-dollar bill at the base of the stage and begins to head for the door. Where are you going? She thinks as she continues to rub her tenderness in the man's face. No, please don't go. You're next. But you, I want to know. She helplessly watches the man of her dreams casually walk toward the door. A man who is selling roses stands by the door and offers him two roses for five dollars, or three for eight. The man buys six and throws one on the floor as he walks out of the exit door. He points to the stripper and says, This one is for you. This is the series of events that took place before he slit her throat. Black Vineyard Vin Keller sat in a slightly reclined position at the table. His bulky frame just about dwarfed the chair he was sitting in. 
He stared steadfast at the interesting necklace of assorted jewels and animal's teeth which draped around the neck of his host. Mr. Noka, the village minister, sat directly across from Vin, who was soaking in subconsciously the dark details and foreboding overtone of the small room. The table, from what Vin could imagine, was probably crafted sometime in the 1800s. It was riddled with elaborate carvings and swirled etchings that simply were not seen in these present times. A smoky, burgundy-tinted glass oil lantern sat in the center of a tattered cloth placemat. The yellow flame was the room's only light source. It swayed and leaned from left to right as it sent its light through the reddish-colored glass, showering all four walls with its somber glow. A house servant requested permission to enter the dimly lit room in his native African tongue. Come in, Hakima, the host commanded. The Negro entered the room holding a tarnished silver tray with two shot glasses and a well-aged bottle of high-priced liquor set upon it. Vin noticed that the tray upon which the glasses and bottle sat was also a probable costly antique with artistic etchings of a master smith. Thank you, Hakima. If I need you again, I shall beckon. The servant nodded as he turned to leave. How long have you been in the village of Black Vineyard? Mr. Noka inquired. Vin leaned forward to take the shot glass of bourbon that Mr. Noka just poured for him. He rubbed his forehead as he answered. Well, Noka, about eight months. Then you must know the reason as to why I've summoned you, Mr. Noka stated. Well, any time anyone ever summons me, the reason is for need of my big game hunting skills, Vin replied. I can only assume that you are in need of them as well. Perhaps something is menacing your village. He continued to assume where the conversation would go. Jungle cats, wolves, reptilian predators, am I correct? He asked. Mr. Keller, you are indeed correct about those things, Mr. Noka said. It is in a dire urgency that I plead for your prowess as a skilled hunter, and that my village has come under attack. There was a brief silence. But even if you were to combine all the creatures that you mentioned, cat, wolf, reptile, I'm afraid that the result would in no way compare to the evil menace that plagues my people. I see, I think, Vin replied cynically. What is it? he asked. I'm without an answer, Mr. Keller. Of course, anyone who has encountered it has died a violent death. Mr. Noka took the bottle to pour him another shot as he grasped for a way to describe the horrible dilemma that faced his people. The terror began, I would have to say, a little over seven months ago, when two of the most tactful, talented hunters in the village began to discover the dismembered remains of animals. Vin listened intently as he swallowed even another shot. Sadly, a lot of the remains they found were of animals that richly fed our community. The hunters began to set traps in various locations in the surrounding jungle in an attempt to capture whatever or whoever was responsible for this waste, but turned up nothing. Nothing? Vin asked. No, Mr. Noka replied. Instead, the findings became much more grisly. Mr. Noka paused and looked at Vin with eyes that were desperate. Vin gazed back into Mr. Noka's eyes and his own mind froze and became deafened by the searing screams for help that appeared to echo from the look of Noka. Mr. Keller, he muttered, believe me when I say that no price you may give me for your valuable service could be too great, nor can my gratitude and appreciation for your agreement to help us. I understand, Vin replied. Now, uh, you say that the findings became more grisly, he asked. Mr. Noka slowly looked away and his gaze rested upon a shelf of musty books and tribal trinkets. He stared at wooden bookend statuettes at each end of the shelf as they were barely lit by the lantern's illumination. The statuette likenesses were of snarling baboon or orangutan-type creatures. 
It was apparent that the sculptor of whom chiseled them into creation paid extreme attention to the detail of these works, down to the many facial wrinkles and razor-like teeth. Shortly after the hunters discovered all the mutilated animals, Noka continued, three of our village women were found by the river partially devoured. Ven's eyebrows rose a little at this bit of information. They were apparently washing clothing and went as three for the sake of safety. After a day, they didn't return, and a search party was sent to find them. Mr. Noka looked somber. My wife was among the three. Ven sat quietly only for a few seconds before tipping the bottle of his shot glass upward. He downed the liquor and placed the glass on the table. With his left forearm, he swiped his mouth, wiping the remnants of the hooch he had just swallowed, and leaned back in his chair. His gaze never strayed from Mr. Noka, and Mr. Noka's gaze never strayed from Ven. Ven's usually erect stature fell into a slump, with shoulders slouching forward as the influence of the liquor took its effect. Mr. Keller... Mr. Noka spoke with concern usually only displayed by a mother inquiring of her ill child. I'm fine, Ven replied. I'll give you all the help within my capacity. Mr. Noka's expression transformed from one of utmost desperation to one of orgasmic relief. His head dropped downward, and its movement resembled that of a tennis ball dangling on a string. He spoke to Vin, even with his head hanging down. Mr. Keller, Mr. Keller, never mind about it all, Noka, Vin interrupted. I'll require a few things of you in order to do this. Anything you need of me, Mr. Keller, just say it and you shall have it, Mr. Noka stated pleasingly. I'll need two of your village's best warriors, and there is the most important thing. A look came over Ven's face, as if he were a doctor relaying to a patient that they were terminal. As much hatred as you may harbor for this terrible creature, you might as well want to acquire something from it as a trophy. You know, something to signify the deliverance of your village from its terror. What are you saying, Mr. Keller? asked Mr. Noka with a look of bewilderment. As a big game hunter, it's a ritual of mine to take any and all possession of a kill for the adornment of my personal collection. Therefore, say no more, Mr. Keller. I understand fully. I'd be happier if I knew every trace of this monster were gone, Mr. Noka interjected. Tomorrow night we'll begin the hunt, as the moon will be an excellent source of light, Ven stated. The time is now to rest as much as can be hoped for. Mr. Noka said. My servant will escort you to your quarters, Mr. Keller. Then struggled to remove himself from his seat. He tried not to stand up too quickly as to defy the alcohol in his bulky system to put him down like a tranquilized elephant. As both men rose to their feet, Mr. Noka opened the door to the room to command his servant. Hakima, show Mr. Keller to his room. The servant nodded and led Venn down a narrow hallway of which was laden with numerous, extremely colorful native masks and assorted weapons common of the tribe. As Venn and Mr. Noka's servant rounded the corner out of sight, Mr. Noka stood in the doorway of the room propping one arm on the jam. He felt his heart beating again as he dropped his head downward. By the grace of the Almighty One, shall we be delivered from this evil? Amen. Noka prayed. The next day was uneventful, aside from Ven and Noka organizing the coming night's hunting regime and plans. Ven's arsenal wasn't of the usual big game hunter. For instance, instead of for most animals of considerable size, Ven possessed a medium-sized single-shot rifle, which was odd once one became educated about Ven's reputation as a hunter. His other weapon of choice was a compound bow and arrows. He kept his arrows tied tightly together and shoved into a leather quiver, which was obviously crafted from an animal hide, perhaps a caribou. When tied together, the arrows resembled a large black cylinder with a bed of nails at the top. Mr. Keller, I regret that I can only summon one of my warriors to accompany you. Therefore... I shall go with you as well, Mr. Noka said. 
As Venn loaded a bullet belt with rounds from a tattered wooden box, he looked at Mr. Noka, who was already attired in a warrior's vesture. His clothing revealed his chiseled features as well as several scars, possibly from previous battles. His right hand gripped a tall, weathered spear, which rested on his shoulder. The spear was also possibly utilized in previous battles. Sun will be going down soon. Then it'll be time to embark, Venn said. Mr. Noka and his warrior counterpart stood side by side. We're ready, Noka exclaimed. They had dinner consisting of roasted boar and fried bananas. Once finished, Venn walked outside to view the blood-red moon, which was already casting its glow behind the trees of the nearby jungle. The final red rays of the lingering sunlight were dwindling into twilight. Insects had already begun to encircle the torches that had been lit outside. As Venn stood quiet, he could hear the faint sounds of the awakening jungle nightlife. He listened as in the distance sounds created a cacophony echoing throughout the walls of the many trees. He took a cigarette from a box in his breast pocket and lit it, continuing to listen as the noises became more defined. And as he took his first drag, the noise stopped. Everything silenced. Aside from a few crickets, which were clearly at the jungle's entrance, there were no sounds within at all. Venn exhaled the smoke that filled his lungs as he listened to the deafening silence. A minute passed as Venn waited for some sort of noise to resume, but what met his ears at the next moment would cause him to wonder. What sounded like the cackle of an 80-year-old woman mingled with the searing, high-pitched squeal of a porpoise was audible. Its distance was obviously in the furthest part of the jungle from where Venn stood based on the echo of the forest and the low-level clarity of the sound. Venn's brow rose as he paused from smoking to continue listening. The noise was real. Not coming from a combination of sources he could tell, but rather coming from the same being. The sounds were slowly growing louder and closer. The noise reminded him of his Aunt Masterly and how she would laugh herself into a coughing fit once she'd get tickled about something. Her face would turn as red as a turnip when she would get going and she wouldn't be able to calm down until she would light her pipe. Upon that thought, Vin threw his cigarette down and smashed its butt with a pivot of his foot. At that moment, Mr. Noka stepped outside and was also greeted by the disturbing sounds. What is that? Venn asked. That, my friend, is the sound of death, Noka replied. There has always been a legend about this jungle, Mr. Keller, as far back as maybe even time itself, that within the deepest jungles of Black Vineyard, the dead never rest. They remain trapped and doomed to stay within the jungle for eternity. Mr. Noka's face became emotionless as his gaze pierced the trees of the jungle, he seemed to stare a thousand miles beyond the jungle peering right into the purgatory in which he was describing. A haunted jungle, Venn asked it with an arrogant grin. That has got to be the hokiest legend I believe that I have ever heard. It matters not, Mr. Keller, Noka responded in a slightly detestable manner. What is fact is that people have died in there, and whatever did it must be stopped. And so we shall gather our gear and begin, Venn stated assertively. In the hour that followed, the three men began a trek through ant-infested palmetto brush. Venn glanced around, soaking in even minute details of the jungle. He observed the vomit-green overgrowth which hugged the thick trunk of every tree, as well as bulky vines that stretched from the base to the tops of the trees. He thought that they bore the resemblance to veins and arteries which caressed the muscles in the pictures of the biology textbooks he recalled from his college days. As they ventured deeper into the jungle, the atmosphere grew darker, more sinister, threatening. The village warrior stayed at the rear of the expedition, caressing the charm of a necklace he was wearing, intermittently kissing the charm as though reciting silent prayers, finishing them off with amens by kissing it. Mr. Noka was clearly on point. Grasping his spear with both hands, he slowly panned his view back and forth with eyes wide. Venn's bow remained draped on his shoulder, 
He didn't even have the bundle of arrows and his quiver united to ensure quick retrieval in a time of emergency. Such confidence at a grave time, such as the present, seemed unwise, Mr. Noka thought to himself as he noticed Ven's relaxed attitude. The night was now full-blown as the darkness shrouded the innards of the jungle, and a slight mist crept closely to the forest floor. The once blood-red moon was now hanging directly overhead, showering bluish rays through the swaying fronds and leaves of the trees, as the sounds of nocturnal creatures added to the eerie ambience within. Then led the expedition deeper into the jungle woods, and they awaited the impending danger to reveal itself with a shock attack or something of that nature. The blackness of their surroundings prompted Mr. Noka to exercise a slight bit of levity to relieve his nervousness. So, what ultimately brings you to this part of Africa, Mr. Keller? His personality resembled the cowardly lion at this point. Is it water buffalo, panther, moose? He prodded on. The thrill of the hunt, mainly, Noka, then answered. Their treads sounded much like raw liver being squashed as their feet fell upon the muddy ground. I see. Are you enjoying your stay here? It's fine, then replied. A few moments passed as they forged forth. The three walked slowly as to ensure that they didn't trip up on a hidden root or a cypress knee because nothing on the ground was visible due to the thick mist layering the jungle floor. It must have been through fatigue and deep concentration that Mr. Noka's mind began to wander, as his eyes were fixed upon Ven's back. Thoughts began to roll through his head like a broken movie projector. Big game, he thought. Big game hunter. Trophy. He couldn't help but hear a small voice in his head suggest that he may be working things out. He felt as though his prejudice was a little tardy as he grew severely uneasier. Thrill of the hunt. Big game. Thrill of the hunt. Personal collection. Um, Mr. Keller. Mr. Noka spoke nervously with a shaking voice. Yes, Noka. Ven replied, yet continued to face forward. I urge to ask a question of you. And before he had the chance to ask the question, Ven slowly turned around to face him. The scene had now taken the most horrifying turn as Ven stood, progressively shaking uncontrollably. His once vital face had now begun to take on an unearthly form as his mouth twisted upward into a ghastly demonic grin. His eyes shined yellow with no iris or pupil and were set in wide sockets and large beige-colored teeth with oversized canines peered from behind his full lips. Long streams of clear saliva dangled from his curved mouth and vibrated like the strings of a cello as his convulsions grew more severe. A voice rattled in his throat as the startling transformation occurred his appearance taking on the form of some sort of simian creature. Remember our agreement, Noka. His voice, low and grumbling, sounded similar to an outboard motor when being shut off. I take any and all possession of a kill for my personal collection. <laughs> the screams echoed throughout the jungle, and then silence. <laughs>